Get a new Apple Card account by July 25th and get 10% back on App Store purchases for your first six months. Up to $100 daily cash. Terms apply. You can earn on games like Candy Crush Saga and Roblox. Subscriptions like Apple TV Plus, in-app purchases, and all the good stuff. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone. Subject to credit approval. 10% daily cash earned on up to a maximum of $1,000 in qualifying purchases. Is valid only for the first 180 days for new Apple Card accounts open between July 11th and July 25th. To make a qualifying purchase, your new Apple Card must be set as the default payment method for the Apple ID associated with your Apple account in the App Store. You must have a zero balance on all digital Apple accounts associated with your Apple ID. Visit apple.co slash app store for more important offer details. From WBEZ Chicago, it's This American Life. I'm Ira Glass. The story that we bring you today is a kind of classic mystery story, but a classic mystery of a very particular kind. It's a real-life Hardy Boys story. Or maybe an episode of Scooby-Doo. There's an old abandoned house. Some kids stumble upon it. They decide to break in. And then at that point, they kind of hit the jackpot, kid-wise. The place is filled, and I mean filled, with fascinating stuff. It's also creepy and mysterious. And there are all kinds of tantalizing clues about what happened there, which they decide to uncover, and which ends up taking years, decades, actually. We are devoting our entire show today to this one story, The House Near Loon Lake. We first broadcast this show in 2001. If you're in your car right now as you hear this, I hope you have a long drive ahead of you so you can stay tuned. If you're at home and it's night, you might consider turning down the lights. Adam Beckman tells the tale. It was my brother's idea to go down to the lake. We'd brought an M80 firecracker, and we wanted to detonate it in the shallow water where we used to swim. We were 11, and it was late fall of 1977. We were visiting a place called Freedom, New Hampshire, a small town of a few hundred people just across the border from Maine. My dad had volunteered to do some maintenance work at a summer camp I'd once gone to. My brother Kenny, best friend Ian, and I went along. We'd been inseparable growing up, but now Kenny had started hanging out with an older crowd, and I'd been seeing less and less of Ian since I'd just transferred to a new school. I was in a funk about losing touch with Kenny and Ian, and so for me, the stakes for the weekend were a little higher than usual. In normal times, we like to go shoplifting or set things on fire. That Halloween, we'd taken cans of WD-40 and gone from door to door, spraying it in the mouths of jack-o'-lanterns till flames burst out their eyes and they blew up in balls of fire. This is my brother Kenny. He's now 37, and he's a scientist. I think Ian's mom um, used to worry a little bit about Ian spending too much time with us or being brought under our bad influence, because I think we taught Ian about, um, you know, throwing wood chips at cars, and we taught Ian about unfolding paper clips so that you could shoot them at people and so on. So we were wandering around, looking for something to do, and we saw the house. It was gray, weathered, and leaning precariously at one end. The windows were boarded up from the outside. Two old cars, probably from the 30s, sat in the yard. One of them had a tree growing up through a hole where the engine had been. At the back of the house, we found a window that was broken, and I remember peering in, into near darkness. I remember it was kind of a, a dare kind of thing. That's my friend Ian. It was one of these things where we just would say, you know, I'd go in that house, wouldn't you? And you'd say, yeah, I have no problem going in that house. And Kenny would say, yeah, that house looks fine. And none of us really wanted to go in the house because we're all scared. But we did. Ian was the skinniest, so it was decided that he should go in first. He slid sideways through the broken panes so he wouldn't get cut and disappeared. After maybe ten seconds, he scrambled back out, clutching a newspaper. It was brown, and I remember it crumbled in our hands. The headline said something about Nazis invading. That was all we needed. Shaker sat on the kitchen table. The main sense I had was of disaster. This is my brother Kenny. As if people had been kind of tootling along in their everyday lives and something terrible had happened, something catastrophic had happened to the people in the house. So catastrophic that no care had been put in a and laugh. But then I felt bad about the joke. I didn't know anyone who died before, and now I was pretty sure I was carrying the wallet of a dead man. The next day, my brother would be going back to his high school buddies, and my best friend would be going back to our old school. I'd have to face the kids at my new school, where I hadn't made any friends, and it seemed like everyone was named Doug and played lacrosse. I'd always been a moody kid, but it was an unfocused sort of moodiness. Now that all this was happening in my life, my gloominess took on a new focus. I brooded about the nascent house. 
My homeroom teacher had been an instructor for Outward Bound. Throughout the year, he made us go solo in the woods around the school. I spent hours sitting out there, alone, with my journal and a flashlight, brooding. The winter passed, and the only curse I suffered was grade 7. That spring, my parents went back to do their volunteer stint at the camp. This time, I brought a new friend, named David. I knew it would impress him. We got up early and packed flashlights in our book bags. I think we even brought a canteen of water. It was raining as we climbed through the window of the house. Nothing looked like it had changed over the winter, and just like the first time, I had this acute feeling of being watched as we moved from room to room, touching things, opening up drawers, climbing up into the attic. David felt it too. All their personal belongings were right there, so they felt so close. And I remember walking through some of these dark rooms, looking around, you know, but, you know, being afraid of perhaps, you know, uncovering something, some evil scene, or discovering that they were there, discovering that they had died there. I remember thinking, I still don't remember the basement. Did you go down the ba- You didn't go in the basement. We never went into the basement. And here's why. The door to it had been blocked shut by a couch that was propped on its end, as if someone wanted to keep something down there from getting out. I remember uncovering, finding a small doll whose face had been burned off. And I remember being terrified of that, thinking this must have been some scene of some horrible ritual. David has a really strong memory of a doll with its face burned off. You- Incredibly personal. I mean, these, these were important artifacts of their family. And if they did leave for some legitimate reason, like you move, you pack up, you move. You don't leave things like a wallet with money in it or, or your address book that has the birthdays written in it of your family members. You know, why, why do you... Why do you leave things like that? How could you? Be mad at me. Mr. Jackson is ugly today. Be sure you get Dad to come to the dance. There's a ball game tonight. Over the next two years, I returned to the Nason house four times in all. And each time I came back with more clues about what happened. I read these letters over and over, trying to decode them, convinced that the answer about the family's downfall was hidden in some seemingly trivial comment or offhand reference. This note is written on school paper by a young girl who was probably my age at the time. Dear Clyde, I wanted a boyfriend, so I thought I would write to you, darling. There's no other boy around here that interests me as you do, Clyde, darling. Call me up, Clyde, darling. When I saw you last night over at Pink's, I thought I would go crazy because I love you so. From your girlfriend, E.D. We had to take things that could help us unravel the puzzle. I mean, I, I don't think we even thought of it being private property at the, at the start because it was just abandoned and no one cared about it. We read notes from doctors and found bills from creditors. We scanned library past due notices and studied postmarks and came up with lots of ideas about why the place had been left. We started to think, gee, maybe these people had their house foreclosed and were thrown out by bankers because it does seem as if somebody might have been shut out of the house with all of the, you know, all of the uh, objects inside. One of my favorite theories was that, you know, the father died at maybe the same time the sons had to go to war because we're looking at papers that talk about war starting and thinking about how a couple of events with an old father and a couple of sons could very quickly finish a family. I remember finding um, information about betting. I think we saw, I think they were tickets or a schedule of a dog track or a horse racing track and the story we made up was, oh, these people had lost all their money gambling.
We needed to find someone who could give us some answers. A person who knew the family, or a distant relative. Freedom's a small town. Someone must have known what had happened. But when we'd go ask, down at the general store or the post office, people gave us the cold shoulder. This confirmed to us that they were part of the conspiracy to bring this family down, or at least part of the cover-up. In retrospect, I realized the adults may have brushed us off because we were 12 years old. It was David who found the breakthrough clue, a matchbook, matches intact, soiled but legible. It said, stop and shop at Nason Grocery, Freedom Side near Effingham Falls Bridge. We rode over and ditched our bikes under the bridge. There were two or three houses on either side, all big old Victorian buildings, but it was obvious to us which one was the Nason Grocery. There were a couple of ancient gas pumps outside and a rusting Moxie soda sign. A rope held the door closed, but we were able to squeeze through. The first thing I saw when we went through the door were the boxes of cornflakes that lined the walls. The Nason Grocery was a completely intact, perfectly preserved store from the 1960s, with products still on the shelves. By the cash register, there were magazine racks and rows of candy. There were glass countertops displaying fishing gear and stacks of canned vegetables, corn and green beans. Some of the cans had exploded from years of heating and freezing, which we thought was cool. Upstairs, there were a few rooms that must have been an apartment. Being in a store all of a sudden reminded us, gee, you know, um, we're breaking and entering in a place that's got, you know, candy. There was a small safe under the counter, and when I turned the handle, the door swung open. Inside, I found four silver dollars and three Kennedy half dollars. I also found a five-dollar gold coin from 1892. I took the coins. I spent the eighth grade kind of detached from school. I'd stare out the window at the falling snow and think about the drifts that must have been blowing through cracks in the house. Or I'd lie awake at night and imagine how still and cold it would be in there. Instead of doing homework, I spent a lot of time reading through my box of Nason letters, drawing up a family tree from the clues we'd found. Every reference to New Hampshire became relevant to the mystery. I'd sit at breakfast and stare at a tin of maple syrup and think about the Nasons. I was pretty sure that if there was some way I could support a family researching... It was much more, a much greater disaster than I had imagined, also much greater mystery than I had imagined, and in many ways much more interesting for that reason. My mom proved to be quite a sleuth. She drove me to the town cemetery, where we found plot after plot of Nason graves. There was Ivan Nason, died 1943... Bertha, died 1968. Virgil, whose dollar bill and driver's license I had, died in 1974. And Jesse, who died in 1969. There was another Jesse William, who had a birth date, but there was no date of death. So, there's less brooding in my life, and what brooding was left had to do with girls. My mother went up on the semi-annual work weekend at the summer camp, and she brought my sister along. When they returned, they told me a story that made my blood run cold. Tell me about the time that you went up with Claire. What happened? That was a big mistake. I think we were both very embarrassed. We were embarrassed. uh, We were both very embarrassed. Yeah. Yeah. I felt I was angry. You were angry? I was. No, we blew it. We blew it, sort of, in a sense. What happened was this. My mother had brought my sister into the house, and they'd seen a child's crib rotting away in the attic, and they decided to take it. So they drove my family's bright orange Volvo station wagon up in front and went in to get the crib. There was no way one could bring that crib down the stairs. And finally, I found a piece of rope somewhere, tied it up, and we lowered it down the window. Found and put them in a small wooden fish tackle box I'd found in the Nason grocery store. I tucked the box up in our attic, and I never went in the Nason house again. Okay. So there's plenty in here. This summer, I went to visit my mother and looked through the box of things I'd saved from the Nason house. All the years I'd spent away from home, she'd kept the box carefully labeled and stored through four moves. There. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I remember that. Yes, the wooden box. You see, that's the wooden box that I remember, and I think it has things in it. Should. The box was as I'd left it, 
a little makeup case with powder still inside, the eyeglasses, some children's records and the coins, photographs of the family, the letters, and there were newspapers. Right on top was the one Ian found that very first day. I don't know when this newspaper is very old. Boston Sunday Globe, look at that. After marching, Jesus, this thing, after marching into the rest of Czechoslovakia in March, Hitler and Chamberlain exchanged speeches. Nazis stayed there, and Chamberlain said he mustn't do it again. <laughs> uh, April 16, 1939. And my, yeah, my grandparents were already in, in exile because of this taking of Czechoslovakia. <laughs> when my great-grandparents fled their home in Czechoslovakia, They'd left furniture, paintings, letters, all very suddenly and never returned. My mother tells me that all those things probably still exist somewhere. With that in mind, she couldn't bear to see the nascent things rotting away like they had. And here's a spoon. It's all very melancholy, all these little remnants. Why is it melancholy? The abandonment. The abandonment is melancholy. You know, I, in a way, uh, it's worse than throwing away, much worse. I can understand one family being obliged to flee or run or abandon, but that nobody else cared, that it was so overwhelmingly abandoned by everybody, that nobody had cared to solve something, to resolve something, that was very offensive to me. That was, you know, it was like leaving a corpse. You don't leave corpse. There was one letter in particular that my mother and I couldn't get out of our heads. It was different from the others, and I'd kept it separate, in a plastic Ziploc bag. It was mildewed and barely legible. April 18, 1940, Laconia Hospital. My darling, excuse writing. It's the best I can manage. They brought me to the hospital here Tuesday night at 8.30, the baby was born prematurely at three yesterday afternoon. I am writing to you, writing for you before I name him. What are we going to do? I'm nearly crazy. Did you get my telegram? Be sure to bring the $20.50. I am weak and can't write more. Hurry, I may die. But I love you more than ever. I registered here as your wife. I knew it would be better. With all my heart and love, come quick. Underlined what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I, you know, I can hardly stand it. <laughs> I can hardly stand it. I've thought about her so often. Mm -hmm. I've... I've worried about her. I've worried about that kid. I've never forgotten these. Yeah. I remember finding that. I think you explained to me what it was about. I don't, I don't think I understood. Yeah. Back home in New York, I started doing research on the internet, working off the list of nascent names I'd found in the cemetery. Eventually, I found this posting at a genealogy website. Nasons of Freedom, New Hampshire. Looking for relatives of Jesse Nason and his wife Bertha. Any info from their kids or grandkids and pictures would be awesome. They are my great-great-grandparents. The person who'd written it is named Samantha Thurston. I sent her an email confessing everything, and this is what she wrote back. Hello, Adam. I'm very interested in what you found and almost wish you had taken all that you found. Jesse and Bertha are my great-great-grandparents. I don't know a lot about them, but they did have a store in Freedom, New Hampshire, and were well-known. We exchanged a few more emails and made plans to meet. Samantha said the immediate family either didn't have many answers or didn't want to talk. Her last email to me included this cryptic postscript about the nascents. They might not be what you'd expect. They are a rough crowd. 
the line is followed with three ex In a minute, from Chicago Public Radio, when our program continues. The last thing you want to hear while listening to your favorite podcast is another gimmicky ad. NJM feels the same way. Instead of using gimmicks, they stand out by providing award-winning service, like assigning you a dedicated rep when you file a claim. And with NJM, you can even save on your auto insurance. Better service and possible savings sounds like a win-win. No jingles or mascots, just great insurance. NJM. Visit njm.com slash podcast for a quote to see how much you could save on your auto insurance. Nationally acclaimed heart surgeons. Advanced treatments for AFib. At Valley Health System in northern New Jersey, elite cardiac care takes many things. Breakthrough treatments for valve replacement. Some you might expect. Access to clinical trials. While others you might not. A team-based approach to your care. Questions that never go unanswered. Valley Health System. Everything medicine can do. A few things medicine can't. Hey, it's Ben Fruman, Editor-in-Chief of Wirecutter. We put together the ultimate moving guide, and I wanted to find out a few of our writers' favorite tips. When you're first moving into your home, make sure that you change the batteries in your smoke detector. Buy a mattress bag. You can carry a mattress more easily because the handles are built in, and it's going to protect your mattress from the truck and the street. Make sure you have towels on hand. You don't want to end up taking a shower and using a dirty sock to dry off. (laughs) Yeah. If you're getting ready to move, let Wirecutter help you make a plan at nytimes.com slash moving. It's This American Life, Myra Glass. We're devoting our entire show today to just one story, a real-life mystery, The House Near Loon Lake. We first broadcast today's show in 2001. Adam Beckman resumes his tale. In August, I drive north to New Hampshire to meet with Samantha Thurston, the woman from the Internet, and see if I can find someone to talk to me about the nascents. I've brought the box of nascent stuff with me. It's small, about a foot square. Inside are family letters, the coins I took from the grocery store, the can of Hershey's syrup from the nascent's kitchen. I'm hoping to give it to someone who cares about this stuff. If not, I plan to bury it on the spot where the house stood. At the turnoff from Route 25, I take a short bypass called Nason Road. On the way into town, I stop to get directions from a woman working in her front yard. She's wearing a sweatshirt that says, Nason Landscaping. Samantha had told me that the Nasons either didn't know what had happened to the house or didn't want to talk. She also said that everyone would know I was in town. It's hard not to feel a little paranoid. Here I am, an outsider from New York City, come to town with details about the past, digging around for more details. I'm apprehensive about what kind of reception I'll get through the center of town. It's Old Home Week, the annual homecoming festival, an event created by the governor to combat problems of abandoned homes and farms in New Hampshire all the way back in 1898. After the Civil War, young people had left the state in droves for better land and opportunities they'd noticed elsewhere. I'd last visited in the 1970s, and a few things have changed since. The town's only store has been replaced with a shop for tourists selling tea doilies, hand-dipped candles, and beanie babies. Farming is pretty much dead, and city people have moved in because they love how charming it is. The place is so self-consciously quaint that you feel like you're on a movie set about a small town. Tidy, with just enough dilapidation around the edges to be rustic. The parade moves past the old town hall, the one shop across the town's only intersection to the cemetery, then turns around for another pass. The theme for the parade this year is, We Are Freedom. When I marched in the parade as a kid, The theme was freedom of the press. I dressed as a radio reporter and pretended to interview the spectators. An irony so bizarre, I don't really know what else to say about it. That afternoon, I check into the only place to stay in town, a bed and breakfast called The Freedom House. I'd been concerned that some distant relative of the Nasons might own it, part of the rough crowd. I shouldn't have worried. The owner's a New Yorker. There's Princess Di memorabilia in the library, and my room's painted bright pink. Um, in fact, it's been called the ooh-la-la room. I've had some people from Paris here came in and said, ooh-la-la, but anyway... Patrick um, Mealy is part of the new breed in Freedom. In the five years he's lived here, he's had the B&B meticulously restored. Antique toiletries and bottles of talcum powder line the shelves of the washroom, 
On a hallway table, silk gloves rest on top of a purse, next to a pair of opera glasses. His things are just like the stuff in my box of nascent knickknacks, only better quality. Standing there with a dirty little wooden box under my arm, I feel sort of pathetic. And when Patrick starts talking about how people can create instant ancestors out of old junk, it doesn't make me feel any better. I've pieced together histories through photos. We've, we've come up with photographs. I have a number of instant ancestors in this house that I've kind of, to create the ambiance. And, you know, in a, f- a few instances, I've tried to trace whatever I could about them. Patrick's learned a lot about the history of the town. So I ask him about the Nason house. He doesn't know anything about it, but he does say that a Nason cousin named Rachel Mulvey once owned this very building and that she lived here and died here. I believe, I think that Rachel's still in the house. I've had a few guests tell me they've heard someone walking on the second floor. So, you know, I don't know that you'll hear it, but I mean, I've I've heard people down in the end rooms. I usually don't tell them, but, you know, she was a little old lady. So, you know, you might hear a little like slippered feet. I have a couple of days to kill before my meeting with Samantha, and at breakfast, Patrick suggests I talk to a few locals who might have known the Nason family. The first one on his list lives right across the street. Uh, Well, my name is Gail. Do you do you remember uh, do you remember the Nason family? Of course, they were scruffy little kids. They were always kind of disheveled and half dressed and needing to be washed. And Hmm. they they were a, a real what do you call it, from the, you know, the ones who went across in the covered wagons and who never got to school and... Really? uh, Well, I guess maybe they did go to school, but I think they went barefoot. They were sort of scary to go by there. If we walked to the beach, you know, you went pretty fast to go. Ostracized. I don't know anything about that. Uh And I don't know the whole family down but she can't confirm anything about 1940 something they built a bypass so that the main route 25 did not go through town anymore and then the town began to die out there was no reason to come to town and then the stores lost business and they began to close up one by one i have no idea whether that's what hit that family. But there may be somebody around who knows. Nathan. Sure. Brought up with them. Carol Chase was the fire chief in Freedom, about the time the house was burned. I find him sitting on his porch on a road outside of town. He's 92 years old and hard of hearing, but he does remember the fire. We just lit it with a match. Newspaper and a match. Was the house empty, or was it full of stuff? Nobody lived there. Why did you start a fire? Why? Yeah. Well, they wanted it burnt. Who wanted wanted it burnt? The people who owned it. That's about all I know about freedom. People mind their own business. He looks away from me as he says this, and I take the hint. Later that day, I learn he's related to the Nasons by marriage. In fact, he's Samantha's grandfather. I spend some time worrying over why he never mentioned this. That afternoon, I go to a junk shop on the outskirts of town. Discarded appliances, clothing, and a surprising number of old family photos. The owner, John Woodard, salvages most of this stuff from traumatic moments in people's lives, a divorce or a death, or when they move from a house to a retirement home. As it turns out, back in the mid-70s, he got a call about the Nason house. They were getting ready to knock down that house, and a guy called me up and he said, uh, gee, you ought to come over. He said, there's boxes and boxes of old whiskey bottles with paper labels and all this stuff in there, you know. I got, oh, 10 or 12 boxes. You know, I've sold them over the years. Do you remember if there's anything in here that you got from the house, the Nason house? house? If I still got some that have labels. One more spot. Let's check down here. John walks me out past aisles of discarded family possessions to a barn filled with hundreds of bottles. 
yeah, say like something like this. Pickwick Ale Bottle. Probably from eh, about 1919, 1920, in the 20s. I'd taken a Pickwick Ale Bottle opener from the Nason house and used it all through college. It was the one relic I'd kept for myself when I packed up the Nason stuff. Do you remember where in the house you found uh, that? These were upstairs. They were upstairs in some boxes. Of course, the roof had fallen in on part of it, if you remember. And the upstairs was a... It was one of those you said, hmm, is it really worth taking a chance getting those boxes down from upstairs, you know? But we did. And uh, John hands it to me. It's got the same veneer of rust on it that everything in the Nason house had. <laughs> this is $5. He gives it to me for free. For my project, he says. I'm supposed to meet Samantha, my internet nascent contact, at the B&B at 1 o'clock, and she shows up 15 minutes early. A red pickup truck tears into the lot in a cloud of dust, and a tough-looking woman in a flower print dress gets out and slams the door. Samantha's young, in her 20s. She's made up, hair tied back in a bow, but her demeanor's all tomboy. Well, I talked to the family yesterday, uh, to actually uh, Alan Nason. He's the one that I'm closest to out of the whole family. We talk, and it's like we've been living in parallel worlds. Samantha's been looking for clues about the family's history for 10 years. She tells me she's been scouring graveyards and reading through public records, trying to construct a family tree. She began her search when she heard rumors that she had Native American ancestry. She decided to find out if she did, to get financial aid for college. Before long, she'd figured out her grandfather was, in fact, an illegitimate child of Ernest Nason, one of Bertha and Jesse's kids although her grandfather was not the person in that letter my mom had remembered all these years. And, and they have a lot of hard feelings in the family, as it is. And Samantha's family, hearing what she was uncovering, wasn't too keen on her research project and didn't cooperate. You know, and it was like, go to hell away. I don't want to talk to you about this. It's none of your business. Mm-hmm. Well, it is. It's my heritage. It's my history. And I, and I, I left my box of stuff from the Nason house upstairs in the ooh la room. I wanted to give it to someone in the family, but I wanted to be sure it would go to someone who'd care. As we talk, it becomes clear to me how much it would mean to Samantha. So I bring it down and put it on the floor in front of her. Wow, how do I get this open? It opens on the... like that. Oh, neat. Oh my goodness, you even got papers? Oh, wow. Yeah, that was probably one of the first things we found when we went in the house. Was that Oh my goodness. Ain't that neat. I can't believe this. This is unbelievable. You have no idea what what you've done. She opens an envelope with her great-great-grandmother's name handwritten on it. She handles it incredibly gently. I watch as she lets the contents fall into her hands. It's a bunch of tiny recipes cut out from a newspaper. Hmm. Oh, my God. And you know what? I never even knew them. <laughs> That's so cool. Oh my goodness. I hope they appreciate it as much. I really do. It's actually a blessing that you had gone into that house during that time period. Because once it fell in, everything was scooped up, thrown in a dump truck, and taken to the dump. And all the memories, everything that they left behind that should have been divvied up so that it could have been passed down was all lost. So it actually was a good thing that you were a nosy little boy. Samantha didn't know much about why the Nason house had been abandoned, but she told me a man named David Buswell, who lives across the street from where it once stood, might have some answers. On the way up to his house, I noticed a sign. Trespassers will be shot. Survivors will be shot twice. David's sitting on his front porch with his friend Mabel Davis. How does it happen you want to know about the Nasons? When I was a little boy, when I was about 11 years old, I I, uh, was in a summer camp here. Once we get talking, I realize the trespassing sign is David's idea of a joke. 
It's Sunday afternoon, and they're drinking mudslides. Do you remember that house? Of course I do, honey. Been in it many times. Oh, really? When the Nasons were living there? Yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Nason were living near there. And I can see Mrs. Nason now taking out a pan of biscuits. Honest to God, I bet that pan was that big. Mabel's arms are spread wide as she says this. The image is pure Norman Rockwell, and frankly, it's a relief. And what, what were the Nasons like? Well, they were wonderful people, really. How would you say about Jess? All of his kids worked and worked hard. Both Mabel and David knew the Nasons and had been in their house. But David, like me, had only been inside after it was abandoned. Oh, it was full of treasures. Old palisades, Morris chairs, advertising cans, you know. The place was just packed with stuff like that. They were pack rats anyway. They collected everything, everything. Why, why, would, they just, uh, why would they just leave all that? Don't ask me. Yeah. Just the way they were. I would think the grandkids would want to... Can't know nothing about it. Didn't care about it? No, none of them. Why not? You know how young people are. They don't care about old things today. Dave and Mabel tell me that Bertha died in 1968 and Jesse soon after in 69. And then things fell apart in the Nason family. When, when Jess died, one of the children was in charge. He was named the executive He was the executive, yes, of the, of the estate. And there were some that were very, very put out. See, he tried to, they had to sign off and give him the authority to dispose of it, and some of them would and not do it. some of them would not do no, it. No, that is correct. It's a terrible thing to say, but as they died off one by one by one, it made it easier, but it wasn't even settled. When this person who was in charge settled the estate, he had died and still it was left. And then the widow was paying the taxes all these years, and she said, well, I'm not going to continue. I finally went to the town and I said, you know, that's a fire hazard. I built a new house here. People are over there pawing around. I said they could step on a nail, a glass, a wire, and and sue. Will you arrange with the fire department to burn it at a practice session? session. In a way, I mean, that was a large family. I mean, how well do you know people? You know, how, how many of them were interested in knowing? And so the house and the store were abandoned because the kids didn't care. In some ways, this was bleaker than anything I'd imagined back when I was 11. I'd assumed a murder or an illness or an accident caused the Nasons to leave all these things behind, something out of the family's control. But in fact, it was the opposite. The family made it happen. They didn't care about the stuff, or they just didn't care to remember. It's too bad they weren't here to tell you. They were characters, weren't they? Yeah. Nice people, but they were a breed that's hard to find. Well, they were the old school. Yeah, David. that's right. Yeah, they were, the... and er- they made everything do. Yeah, they but didn't... didn't everybody then? Those were the good old days. You're not dear, kidding. When every we had everything but money. Yes, I guess so. You better believe you. I did. had a swimming pool and a Mercedes, but well, the rest of course of... you would, and a place for a pony, but. I... <laughs> Members of the Nason family who declined to be interviewed on tape confirmed the story Mabel and Dave told me. Jesse and Bertha Nason lived in the house until 1946. That's when they opened the store near Effingham Falls and moved to the apartment above the store. They took what they needed and left the rest in the old house, using it as storage and keeping open the possibility that they'd move back someday. When Jesse and Bertha died, the fight over the estate began. Immediately, their kids, there were nine of them, locked up the store until it could be resolved. The house stayed pretty much as it was. After 11 years, the fight was settled, the property was auctioned, the money was split, and the buildings were razed to the ground. I asked an older Nason why they didn't clear out the precious things in the house, and she said, what precious things? It was full of crap. 
and I mean crap. As for the woman in the letter that my mother was never able to forget, no one knew anything about her or her baby. Dave and Mabel told me, this just figures in a little town like Freedom. Are you kidding, honey? No. It's a Peyton place. And explain that. What do you mean? No, it's just like every other town. Yeah, there's nothing different. There are all no. of these little skeletons in the closet and yeah. bedroom affairs that, yeah. Things that happen like in any typical old no. town, right? Yeah. It's all by gossip. It, it's all, yeah. yeah. In retrospect, I know it was little much, my obsession with the nascents as a kid. I found this stuff in their house precious, so I assumed they would too. But of course, the relics in their house weren't about my life. They carried no memories, good or bad. It's possible that for the nascents, they were reminders of an inheritance dispute, or other disputes, that they'd just as soon forget. When I was talking to my friend David about the nascent house, he told me this story. His wife's father had recently and suddenly died and left behind a house that no one in the family wants. So David and his wife Susan now find themselves involved in figuring out what to do with it. I feel like it's on the cusp of being abandoned. No one's living there. You know, it's ripe for being vandalized. And what do you do with a house like that? And now it's, it's strange. I mean, it's, it's tied up in this weird world of legal probate where you can't really do anything with the property. You just kind of have to maintain it until some future court date. You know, it, it, the property's become a, a ball and chain. And Susan said an interesting thing was, you know, gosh, I, I wish that house just burned down. And I was thinking, gosh, well, why would you wish the house to be burned down? It's partly, you know, it's, it's uh, there's a lot of memories tied up in the house and emotions tied up between her and her dad and symbolized by the house. <laughs> But uh, something about it seems relevant. (laughs) I wanted to show Samantha the spot where the house had once stood. So in the early evening, we walked through town and onto Loon Lake Road. We crashed through the bushes for a while, hoping that we could find the old foundation or something, but there wasn't a trace. In fact, the very land where I remember the house was gone. The soil had been hauled away weeks before by bulldozers constructing part of the new Freedom Elementary School. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure it was right in this flat spot. Right. This um, is all new. I but think it's through there. Because you have a stone wall. Later, when I was packing to leave town, I found a small... Davis, the woman Adam talked to on her friend's front porch. Adam's mom, Elizabeth, and his best friend Ian, who first entered the house with Adam, both died in 2020. There's nothing left for me Of days that used to be I live in memory among my souvenirs Our program was produced today by Wendy Dore and myself with Alex Bloomberg, Jonathan Goldstein, and Starley Kine. Senior producer for today's program is Julie Snyder. Additional production help on this rerun from James Bennett II, Ella Mustafa, Stone Nelson, and Matt Tierney. Special thanks today to Carol Ford, Madeline Eldridge, Ron Beckman, and Jason Bittner. Our website, thisamericanlife.org, where you can stream our archive of over 800 episodes for absolutely free. This American Life is delivered to public radio stations by PRX, the public radio exchange. Thanks, as always, to our program's co-founder, Mr. Tori Malatia, who describes a typical weekend this way. A teenage daughter returns late from a dance with a rose. She pins it to the mirror and hangs her dress in the closet. And then something horrible happens. I'm Ira Glass. Back next week with more stories of This American Life. Next week on the podcast of This American Life, one of our producers tries to quit smoking using one of the most popular books out there. Okay, I've had a bunch of snacks, and nothing makes it better. Like, literally nothing makes it better. Everything makes everything that I do instead of smoking makes me want to smoke more. Can a book rewire your brain? Answers next week on the podcast or on your local public radio station. <laughs> <laughs>